Hey folks, Darth checking in with you again. So, I haven't put out any new videos pretty much since the last episode premiered. And don't get me wrong, it, Christmas, the new year, etc. definitely factored into that. But that's like, you know, two weeks ago, maybe a little more. So, uh, yeah, a little more than two weeks ago, actually, almost 20 days. So, let's talk about why a little bit, yeah? If I'm being totally honest with myself, I, I intended, whenever I watched the final episode, to then go back and re-watch the entire season of The Wheel of Time, of Amazon's Wheel of Time, and kind of rehash uh, the the season as a whole now that it had come out and re-experience it through the lens of a of a completed work you know uh, in its own in its own right and the the night after the episode came out um, which would be Christmas Eve you know immediately after it came out, it just really kind of didn't sit well with me. You can see that in my individual, like, immediate reaction to the episode. You can probably also see that in the lack of follow-up content on that episode. Because usually I would make two to three videos per episode. Um, so it just didn't sit right with me. But the day after that, I saw that Rafe Judkins did an interview. And in that interview... He said that when they were making the show, they expected that they would alienate hardcore fans. And that the hardcore fans wouldn't like what they were producing. Now, it's not that he's wrong. I, I get what he's saying, you know. There are people out there that are going to nitpick any decision, any critique that he could make of it, anything that he could do, um, and those people would be impossible to please, I, I agree with that, conceptually, you're not trying to cater to that audience, because there's no catering to them, you know, that's like trying to cater to an extreme Star Wars fan, right, um, it just won't happen. But, if I can carry that analogy a little bit further, the baseline for pleasing a Star Wars fan is giving them a good lightsaber battle. And the baseline for pleasing a Wheel of Time fan is... I've been torn on this. I've thought about what to say here. And I get to this moment, and now I can't decide which one's more important to me. Is it portraying the characters well? Or is it telling the epic story well? I don't know which one it is. But on both fronts, season one feels like a failure. Um, I'll tell you right now, the reason that this video has been delayed so long is because I have not went back and watched season one again. Something about it is hard for me. Like, it, it feels like work. I, I've re-watched the first four episodes, but five, six, seven, and eight, you know, four was kind of the highlight, and even it, I thought, had just significant issues and sitting there thinking man this is my holiday and it's all going downhill from here I just felt like I was setting myself up to be upset you know um so I haven't watched five six seven eight I intend to and when I do I'm gonna make a season review that incorporates those into it but for right now there's just other stuff that I gotta got kind of get off my chest as somebody who greatly cares about the the characters you know I mean I was I was a nerdy kid in school nobody else 
where I grew up had ever heard of these, much less read them. And I read them a dozen times, hell, in my teenage years, probably. Like, these were my friends, you know? Uh, it's, maybe that's caring too much, I don't know. But, um, and I don't say that to disparage any of my real life friends. I love you guys too. Um, but, you know, it's just like, I, I had such great relationships and I think that that's a testament to the power of good writing um, Robert Jordan did an incredible job of creating a world that feels lived in and real and he did an amazing job of putting these characters through trials and struggles and success and failure heartache, love everything you know, uh, down to little inside jokes with one another uh, down to inconsistency between their thoughts and actions. He made them feel so real that I felt like I knew them. And while the acting is good in this show, you know, I, I don't... Look, I, I watch Daniel Green's review. Daniel Green talks a lot about editing. I've talked about editing a little bit, but honestly, I'm not an editing guy, folks. I am a writing guy. I significantly. I've done a lot of writing in my life. Um, and I, I'm definitely more of a writing guy. I understand how to hit a satisfying plot beat. I understand how to develop characters. Um, you know, don't George Lucas me on this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be your guy for dialogue per se. So I'm not going to be overly critical about if somebody said something cringy because I say cringy shit all the time, but, uh, you know, I, I get how to put a narrative together and plot it out, and I understand world building to a T, and the writing here is such, it's such a shit show. This is writing at a level that would be consistent with well, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., or Supernatural, or, uh, you know, just like a, a long-standing serialized show that is meant for rewatchability, 20 episodes a season, that kind of thing. There's nothing wrong with those shows, mind you. I happen to really enjoy, uh, both of them, right? Uh, admittedly haven't watched Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. since, like, season three or four, but, uh, but, like, I really especially Supernatural, I liked it, you know, they did a great job developing Dean and Sam, um, and, and Castiel, of course, is great, had some weirdness with, the, whatever, we're not getting into Supernatural right now, <laughs> what I'm saying here is that, um, when you have eight episodes, and you have a pre-built narrative, and you have characters that are already dramatically loved, you know, uh, a lot of the hard work of setting up the series has been done for you. That's why a studio buys in on an existing IP with a built-in fan base. That's why it's not a completely new original idea. Because that built-in fandom, that already generated productive IP is a sort of seal or guarantee for the studio that they can have some above average expectation of a return on their investment. And to my mind, when you abandon that in favor of your own ideas, it sounds to me like you didn't want to make the show that the studio signed you up for. It was just the only way to get your foot in the door. And that's uh, great for Rafe personally. I'm very happy for him that he's getting to, to go out there and create something. And for Rosamund Pike and for Daniel Henney, uh, Yosha's going to be a star in a couple of years, you know, if, especially if this takes off and does well. Like, for this group of people who's making a work, it's a very exciting, awesome time for them. I'm not critiquing 
these people as people. But what they're doing to an IP that they seem to not have an abundance of respect for is absolutely disgraceful to people who have loved it and grown up with it. It's, uh, you know, that's, that's graffitiing a monument, if you will. Um, so I, I'm very disappointed. And I think that a lot of it could be fixed in future seasons. I think that a lot of it could have been fixed this season if people were a little more careful when they decided to make changes. Um, I can, I can give some easy examples here, you know, and, and by the way, I'll address this really quickly. Bernie Harris left, COVID happened. I recognize that both of those things make this a shit show for episodes seven and eight. And episodes seven and eight are particularly the two that I have the biggest problems with. So I recognize that some of that, these people might feel like they can hand wash and go, not my fault, right? Uh, but I'm going to tell you right now that that's not how responsibility works. And that five years from now, if your show is successful, when I'm trying to get somebody else to watch it, when it's the thing that everybody's talking about, like people were talking about Game of Thrones when seasons four and five happened, and it became a cultural phenomenon, no one's going to fucking care that COVID was happening when you made episodes seven and eight. Nobody's going to go back and watch it through the lens of context. They're just going to see that your product wasn't as good. So when I review you, that's the standard. Because the standard is a standard. It does not adapt, right? And so in that regard, episodes seven and eight fucking suck. Uh, they do a number of things horrifically wrong. And I have spent a lot of time trawling forums, interacting with people who are watching the show, reading the books, etc. The biggest things that they do wrong are that they don't generate the stakes that are inherent to what's happening at that point in the book series, which just straight up means they were written weaker and that they completely lack clarity. There are an exorbitant number of people that are having to go to weekly ask questions to a Wheel of Time book reader, uh, you know, uh, page on the Wheel of Time subreddit and ask questions because they don't want to be spoiled by Googling something, but they don't understand basic things. Like, I thought Rand was the Dragon Reborn. Who was that other guy that said he was the Dragon Reborn? Or, what's a Tavira? Or, so, this magic, does it just do whatever? And, uh, people thought Murdral were the Dark One. People don't understand, uh, who that guy was that sucked an arrow into his face. Um, people didn't understand how Nynaeve got brought back from the dead. Uh, they don't know what the Horn of Valir is. They don't know why Padden Fane was talking to Perrin. They thought Loyal died. Rafe, and Rafe's not alone in this, but he's the showrunner, so he's kind of the avatar that I'm using when I talk about this stuff. He's had to go back and answer questions for people that didn't get the answer to those questions from the show. And any time that that happens, it is a problem. It's a problem because for every person who was engaged and willing and interested enough to go and do that, there were 10 of them who just went, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And I don't know turns into, I don't care. And it, it just, it doesn't go well. You know, it's a, that sort of apathy is how it, maybe your show stays up. Maybe you're on The Walking Dead Season 13, but everybody stopped watching in Season 5, you know? Um, it's, 
it's a tough thing. All right, this is this is getting rambly and uh, is sort of pretentious. I think uh, this is not a review of the season. This is more me explaining why I haven't yet done a review of the season, uh, and you know. Why were those people with ball gags waving their arms around and shooting a tidal wave at a little girl? Yeah, I don't know either, people. I have no idea. That's... <laughs> um, the, the thing I guess I really want to say here is this. Your COVID issues that have happened, that are still happening... God love them. I've lost family friends, you know. Fortunately, I haven't lost any immediate family. I know this sucks for everybody. It doesn't change the ability to tell a good story. I, it might change CGI, you know. It might change the... Um, it, it might change the ability to get cast and crew members together which limits your writing, but, you know, what I have found in my experience, uh, trying to be creative, is that limitations facilitate creativity, and two of the big things I wanted to hit on here, which are just now kind of coming back to me in this, because I got more upset about that than I thought I was going to on screen just now. Uh, so I kind of lost my track there for a bit. Two things that really hit me here that I wanted to mention were this. Um, episodes 7 and 8 were not sent to Brandon Sanderson. He got to see 1 through 6 and make adjustments and edits on them, etc. But he did not get to do that with 7 and 8. And immediately, I think that that underscores how important Sanderson is because his suggestions the instant you lose them there's a quality drop off that if it was measurable on a scale of 1 to 10 I'd say it's 4 points Sanderson's improving you 4 points in the details you know and by the way that thing that I just said about writing and restrictions uh, that's actually a uh, paraphrase of something that he said in one of his creative writing courses. Uh, so, uh, the dude knows how to craft a story. You guys should probably get him more involved. Uh, the other thing I want to mention here, which I started to talk about earlier and I kind of got sidetracked on, was that the Witcher fandom. I've not read the Witcher books. I played the games. I like the games. Uh, the fandom of The Witcher is rioting right now over season two of that show. And I don't have love for The Witcher like I do The Wheel of Time. I know The Wheel of Time super well. To me, The Witcher is fun. I I watched season two. Episode one was the best. It felt like a, like a side quest, you know? But uh, even even disregarding that the other episodes weren't quite as good and that the writing had some shakiness and some issues, The Witcher Season 2 was a lot of fun. Uh, the CGI dragon snakes at the end of it looked amazing. They were just awesome. That is really a huge step up from the dragons that were in uh, Season 1 of The Witcher, or the goat dragon that was in that season. You know, uh, that gives me a lot of hope for this, but... I make the point about The Witcher to say that the fandom is rioting over things that I, as a non-hardcore fan of The Witcher, still a fan, just not a hardcore one, I didn't particularly notice. They're saying that they're assassinating the characters, etc. I don't know, it doesn't seem bad to me. And so, when I say that, I say it to say that that's one of those examples of you know, a fandom that's going to be mad no matter what you do. I understand Rafe not catering to them. Because that audience of the Wheel of Time would be unhappy no matter what. However, you can't alienate 
your entire book family. And when you make changes, like depriving Rand of his moment with the Trolloc army, or messing up integral lore, such as who the dragon was, and why he was trying to seal away the Dark One. Or, you know, um, take away characters that are important, such as uh, Elias, because without Elias, we have no context for why Perrin's eyes turned yellow that one time, and didn't stay that way, apparently. When you do a bunch of stuff like this that muddies the water on the story, you're not... If you know what I mean, I was totally coming into this cool with changes. I enjoyed a lot of changes. I did. I thought that, uh, you know, uh, Moraine was honestly a stronger character here. Uh, I like her a lot in uh, the book, but she's a lot less aloof here. Aes Sedai are less aloof in general. They uh, they interact a lot more, which I like. Uh, Lamb and Nynaeve are developed better. I'm not even super opposed to fridging Perrin's wife. Like, it's a, it's kind of a negative thing, but I understand why it happened within the context of the show. Uh, it could have been done better. Brandon Sanderson was right. Master Luhan would have been a better one to kill off. But still, still just, just ignoring all that stuff. I'm a super fan. You're not going to alienate me by making small changes. You're not going to get the Witcher effect, right? But... If you start making huge, dramatic changes to the lore, and they already don't make sense or internally conflict, which is even worse. Uh, internal conflict, an example of that being, uh, why did Moraine think this was the last battle that she was leading Rand to? She knows that they haven't checked any of the boxes on the Caratheon cycle. She knows that Kalendor hasn't been pulled out. So... Are you going to cut Kalendor later, or are you going to go back and say that Moraine was stupid? When you start doing a bunch of that, you're no longer... Uh, it then becomes an excuse when you say that you're not trying to cater to the hardcore fandom. Because at this point, you're not catering to any fandom, because you're not telling the same story. As a matter of fact you're actively alienating the built-in audience, which was the whole reason that the IP was created. So, I just needed to highlight that disparity, because, honest to God, I, and I'll talk about this a lot more in my season review, I think that this is completely a stronger show when they don't feel like they're tied to the Wheel of Time. When they feel like they have to throw in Mach and Shen because he was there. 